Good morning. I am Delina Laverne Spencer Wilkerson, or as the neighborhood would know me as Delina Laverne. <laughs> that meant my mother and my grandmother was on the steps, and I had overstayed somewhere. <laughs> my mother, Reverend Janelle Delina Spencer Wilkerson, was an only child. Her mother, um, who traveled the world, abandoned her and came home to die from leukemia when she was 13. So we lived with or near my great-grandmother, uh, Geneva Marie McLean Spencer, in a four-room home <coughs> until about 1968. And we all called her mom. I was the oldest of six. There were three boys, three girls, which meant that there were times when that four-room house had nine people. My earliest memories include playing outside, obviously there was a room inside, uh, making up games with or without my siblings or friends, a boy, down the block who stole my tricycle and my hero, mom, uh, marched right down there and got it back for me. Those are the kinds of things that stick with you. We had a fruit trees in our yard and a forever nosy neighbor who lived across the street who loved to tell my mother all the things I had done wrong before I got a chance to get a word in. Bless her heart. <laughs> <laughs> we were clearly poor, but I didn't feel poor, which in hindsight I contribute a lot to the advantages of segregation. All black folk lived together in the same area on the west side of Cider City, North Carolina, regardless of wealth. We weren't allowed to live anywhere else in the city. There were no segregated poor neighborhoods. The people with big houses lived across the street from people with small houses. There were no apartment buildings, no public transportation, no taxis to this day. Many families, including ours, did have a car some of the time. And when it didn't, when we didn't, we walked. There was one volunteer fire department. There was one hospital in which everyone went to, uh, black or white. All of the doctors, of course, all the nurses were white. All the firefighters were white. Siler City, which is to this day primarily segregated, not unlike Chicago. We lived in one of the three black neighborhoods until I went to high school and my parents bought a house in, out by the airport which started out segregated, but uh, within a few months became all black. Two other things of note about Silo City. Some of you may know the Andy Griffin show. Yeah, yeah. Aunt B. Yeah. She retired to Silo City. Uh, the other thing you may know, person you may know, is uh, David Duke. Uh, he also, did not live there, but visited to start a uh, protest because a large number of Hispanics had moved to town to work at the local um, poultry plant. Thanks. Ironically, the population of Zalo City today is predominantly Hispanic. 
But you would not know that if you came to visit. There's no way to see what the population is, primary population is. But back then, I lived within walking distance of most of my mother's relatives. And fortunately, I was also within walking distance of our church, our school, the local black-owned grocers, the barbershop, the beauty salon, the funeral home. I was born in 1955, the same year the Supreme Court ordered or required desegregation with all deliberate speed uh, from the schools. For me, that deliberate speed took 13 years. Up to that time, there was only one segregated black school, Chatham School, for grades 1 through 12. All of our teachers were black, including three of whom were my great aunts, one of which was my uh, first grade teacher, which I learned later. Um, growing up, there were three of us who were running buddies. We got into a lot of trouble, et cetera. <laughs> So the school had had a meeting to decide to make sure that we were broken up and not in the same classroom. Um, in many ways, that still happens. <laughs> my sixth grade teacher uh, actually rented a room from one of my aunts who lived next door. I had some of the same teachers as my mother, which has its pluses and minuses, as you might imagine. <laughs> Expectations, though, were for achievement were very high and unrelenting. Uh, in the fifth, sixth, seventh grade, the, my math teacher and um, English teacher, if, when they made a test, if you missed any of the first three, you got spanked. <clears throat> Needless to say, that only happened once for me. The downside to that, though, is I often got, for whatever reason, called to other classrooms where the teachers made examples of their classes using me which got me loved on my way home, <laughs> frequently. At the time, there was also two all-white elementary schools and one all-white high school. That high school, Jordan Matthews, was desegregated the year before I went to high school. That same year, I participated in a walkout because something happened with the uh, uh, football I don't know, I don't remember what that was. But my mother was appointed to the uh, committee to help clarify the problems with the black and white students. And so I was uh, not allowed to participate in any further demonstrations. Fortunately, there were no further ones. For the next four years, I was typically one of two or three black students in all of my classes. All but one of my teachers were white. The Spanish teacher was black. I had a similar experience when I came here to graduate school at the University of Chicago. But as I grew older, the memories are decidedly different. But what all still had in common is I almost never interacted with anyone who was not black during my early years. I was shielded from most overt acts of racism, and my family did not talk about it around their kids. And for a long time, we didn't have TV, so we didn't see it either. We were taught to be wary of white people and were required to be on our best behavior whenever we were around them. We did not have a lot of white on black crime, though, and no road cops in South City. So I did not grow up with that fear either. 
If I ran into over racism at the department store or at the doctor's office, um, I, it didn't register with me. It wasn't until I was old enough to explore on my own in the area that I ran into or felt uh, racism. There were, of course, the kids hiding in the bushes, calling me the N-word as I walked by. And there were places I was not welcome. I remember my great uncle, Skim, who was a cobbler in downtown, who would sometimes take me to get um, hot dogs for lunch. And we would go outside under the colored only sign to place the order. He was nevertheless also a well-known tap dancer, and no, I do not know how to tap dance, <laughs> and a rock collector who lectured at nearby colleges about geolog his geological findings. Every time I came home from college, he would test me sometimes in French. Do I speak French? <laughs> <laughs> While neither of my parents went to college, I was not the first in my family to do so. I was expected to go to college, and with several scholarships, campus jobs, and federal grants, I did so. Livingstone College was an all-white college in Salisbury, North Carolina, founded in 1879, by a group of African Methodist Episcopal Zion ministers. We were, in fact, across the street from Fatawa College, which some of you may know is an all-white UCC college. Livingstone is also affiliated with the huge Hood Theological Seminary, which meant when I was there, the ratio of men to women was seven to one. However, the Amy Zion is known among, is a leader among the Protestant denominations in ordaining women. And in point of fact, my mother was um, ordained. I have been surrounded by the church my entire life. In Silo City, there were three major black churches. Uh, one was the Baptist Church, one was the um, Church of God in Christ, and one was ours, Corinth, A.M. Zion. My family <coughs> all were involved heavily in the church, uh, everything from elders to the choir, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I stayed in the church pretty much until I moved to Chicago to come to the University of Chicago. Um, I, in college, went to Vesper every Friday morning and um, every Wednesday evening, um, I also went to church. Sundays, however, were my day off. Sometime after I graduated from the UFC, I've, a friend introduced me to the non-denominational 4,000 member Christ Universal Temple founded by Reverend Johnny Coleman on the far south side. I renewed my faith there. I um, had an eye-opening experience there. Um, I heard both Gladys Knight and Dallas Della Reese preach there and enjoyed a 90-member choir um, and the library in the back of the church after service. Joanne's Sunday school class had 100 kids in it. But it was um, on 119th off of the Dan Ryan, and there were very stressful 
trying to get there because you were not there before church started. You did not have a seat. That plus their refusal to have a communion service for Sally and I made us decide to look for a new church. So shortly after Jelani's baptism, we started looking around Oak Park and we found this one. I cannot say often enough how important it has been to our family that this church is who it is. Even though those of you who are members know I complain all the time. <laughs> you should 